Welcome to the Play Healing Parent Podcast with me, your host, Debbie John, and I am so happy to have Jeff Steed on this podcast. He is the Chief Product Officer for My Tutor, and I was looking at his LinkedIn today, thinking about where you've come from, and I'm really curious about how you get to those kinds of jobs, and it looked like you started your own business um, with your computer science background and then got acquired. Is that right? I am from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh -huh. um, I, I do have a computer science background. Um, I sort of started my career a bit lost and not really knowing what I wanted to do and drifted around a bit um, and, and discovered education primarily in the UK and primarily not mainstream education, but but further education colleges, young offender institutes, and I met a bunch of very interesting educators who were championing better literacy numeracy skills, and I decided that was the thing I wanted to use my computer skills for. So so I I, I joined an existing tiny publisher and helped them turn away turn from being a paper publisher to kind of digital learning digital things um, and we were acquired that, that the, the being bought is true but it wasn't my company I, I met up with a bunch of very inspirational educators passionate about using it to transform kind of lives of young people who drifted off off the mainstream track a bit and that kind of connected with some passions that I, I hadn't quite connected computer science and passion yet it was just two different parts of my life and they came together quite nicely that's amazing because you can be really creative with you know, digital devices, can't you? And you can really, they can really aid and you talk about them being tools. And I think since coming back into the education system myself and teaching you know, key stage three music and then A-level music tech, I found that the A-level music tech on Logic, using Logic and playing around with sounds are actually playing a lot more than my poor old key stage three children having to go through this curriculum or everybody learn African drumming today and then everybody learn this keyboard piece and then everybody learn guitar, you know. Um, so I, I'm really excited about hearing the kinds of things you're excited about. Now we've got the whole invention of AI and and everything like that. But so how, how did things form? I mean, when you were a, a child, let's talk about that. Have you got this kind of natural creative background? Have you always loved playing? What kind of things were you into when you were growing up? Um, great, great question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm an enthusiast for playing and trying out something stupid and just doing things and, and learning by throwing yourself into it even though you you're not very equipped to pull it off and uh the, the lovely thing as you get older is that somehow you do pull off more and more of them because you've pulled off some you've tried so many other weird sports so one of the or activities or cr types of creativity one of the, the the problems in my life is i have a, a large not decrepit garage which can hold all the various toys that i've bought through my life because I was determined that I would be a unicyclist, so I'd be a great juggler, or slacklining is what it's really about, or power kites, it's the way to go. Oh, wow. I've, I've done an, a, enough of just about everything you could imagine in that sort of play activity realm to, to sort of know what I'm doing, but not enough to actually be able to do any of it. And then it finds a place in the garage when I get excited about the, about the next thing. So I, um, yeah, I probably, um, I, I, it probably would be fair to describe me as an enthusiast for just trying, trying, trying things out. Um, yeah, I, and I, you I, need I, safety, I, don't you? You need to feel safe to have a go. We find a lot of the time at the moment um, that young people are are scared to try things. That perfectionism is massive. That anxiety is coming in, and they're actually scared to have a go. So, what do you think in your upbringing gave you that? confidence to have a go was it modeled to you by your parents yeah I think I think my parents kind of genuinely thought we should do whatever we wanted to do as kids and just try it and so so I'm one of four and we all do entirely different careers there's almost no connective tissue between what we do the kind of roles you know one, one's a chef one's a, a photographer and now and now a kind of healer yoga teacher one's a very straight down the line doctor in a rural 
hospital in South Africa, which is very, very different types of things. And I think they always just just were enthusiastic about our enthusiasm. Somehow that helps. But I do think kids kids today have a tough audience because their audience is everybody, right? Their audience is Instagram or their audience is, it's a sort of big public audience. And so, so I've, I've done endless stupid things that not too many people have seen. And then when people have seen it, I've kind of shrugged it off because I've built enough self-confidence at having done more stupid things before and pulling them off. Um, and and uh, whereas I think that's a lot tougher if, you, if you've got this sort of imagined massive audience who's judging you and quite willing to be quite kind of negative. So I, I, th I think I probably was lucky with that. Mm -hmm. Maybe also I'm slightly lucky being a uh, South African because I think the, the British culture seems much more worried about what the neighbors think and what the right appropriate behavior is or what your particular group of people think about you. And I, I, I think growing up, my my peers around me in South Africa, there were more people doing more weird things and kind of all muddling along together. And so I think there was a greater tolerance for just trying something and seeing what seeing how it works out. Um, so I, I think probably I benefited from from my age, the, the era I grew up in, and my parents and 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 some of the culture. Love that. I think that's it, it, it is we are the environment around the child as parents and we kind of set the tone and we model this to the kids. And I'm trying to get that kind of message out to parents that we can continue to play. We, we never need to stop playing, but playing can take on so many forms, just as you're into your kite surfing and maybe circus skills and then. I've just got into running again, you know, it's just all these kinds of things and permission to have a go, that freedom. I love hearing that you all did different, completely different kinds of careers. And so the exciting thing I think about the the things that are coming in now, the, the way we can have bespoke learning, we can go at the pace of the child when I was a play therapist it's all about letting the child lead the way and we can do this in education now and I know there's a load of um, talk about the dangers of tech and um, and and we you know I don't think governments have put enough legislation and um, worked with tech companies enough to make it safe enough for our young people. That's that's a given. I mean, I was at an NSC PCC conference about 10 years ago and they were talking about this kind of stuff and it's still only just coming in now. But I would love to just know a few case studies of where you've seen play and tech come together. You've seen... Um, education completely revolutionized by maybe the, the certain digital platforms or maybe going right up to the AI um, discussion now. Um, tell me how, how you see um, things unfolding right now. And yeah, I think tech with children is maybe like scissors or electricity or something like that. So it's, it's dangerous in itself, but it's also a tool or a thing that enables all sorts of other creativity or other things that can happen. And it isn't safe. It's a thing you need to learn to use. But if you teach your children to use scissors from 18 months or two or two and a half, you give them rougher, blunter scissors and they can't hurt <laughs> themselves that much, but they can hurt themselves a bit that by the time they get older, they get very good at making things. Whereas if, you, if you're scared and you don't let them touch scissors, then that it's sort of more likely to cause more of a problem for eventually when they get a pair and they haven't learned, you can't run with them. <laughs> so so um, I, I, I think Love the analogy. It's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky area, but you started off talking about music tech. Um, so let's, let's look at sort of slightly older kids for a second. Um, right now there's, when I started in technology, you were asking about creativity and then to be creative was quite cryptic because you've been creative in bits and bytes and coding language. And there wasn't a lot of sort of human centric interface. Whereas now there's amazing music tech, amazing photography, tool, tech around photography, image manipulation, creating, being creative, recording your voice, making videos, distorting videos. It's, it's sort of in everybody's hands. And so there's actually an amazing power of, 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 of creative tooling that's available. It, it's widely available. And maybe 
doesn't necessarily mean people know what to do with it yet, but mm. but it's it's these sort of powerful tools that could enable you to create a different voice, create different personas, build stories, um, record music, make videos, make make um, which is like unprecedented. It's amazing. It's stuff that would previously have cost thousands of pounds, and now it's in most people's pockets, the teenagers' pockets, and um. So I I think there's a um, there's an incredible amount of things that you can play and create and do right now. Mm. Obviously, as you get younger, younger and younger and younger, the fact that there's not really good guardrails and it's not really always good controlled on some of these things get tougher and tougher to deal with. Which is why which is why I think there's some sort of handover period where it's totally legitimate that you don't want to give your child a smartphone until they're a bit older or you mm -hmm. you don't want to just lock them into a video watching YouTube's continually you actually rather just keep them away from it or keep it contained and buy one of these particular sort of walled garden tech tools tablets yes. that only give you certain types of things or um, and I think that's totally understandable I I, 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 I I really get that but I also think we shouldn't be too scared of the scissors because actually those scissors are also really powerful and it can enable a shy withdrawn kid just to be shy and withdrawn but still be massively creative because yeah. they've got tools yeah. that they can do things with. possibly find online friends and build new relationships yeah. should possibly also just find find their find their find their soul or find their creative soul so i'm a i'm a um yeah i'm a big fan of of, of the fact that there are so the tools to create are so accessible right now yes. that, that there is a sort of the play and tech and learning do intertwine quite a lot more. Yeah, I think that's really interesting how the pause, play, connect model comes into play. It can be reflected in what you're saying. It's pausing to educate and 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 often I've had to sort of pause and do some psychoeducation about the stress response in our body and why that inhibits our ability to play but also we can pause and do some sort of education around the types of you know programs that would be really safe for a parent and a child to try together or you know or or talking about the dangers in a really simple way but also talking about the advantages and it's hard to get a balanced message across isn't it and a simple enough message across that's kind of one of my massive passions because before I turned 40, I was like, right, I want to get to 40 and I want to be an expert in something. But then I realized very soon that you can waffle on at this level, but it's not going to actually serve and help anybody if they don't understand what you're talking about or they can't use the tool or the idea that you present them with. And that's why I'm all about you know, keeping things simple, accessible. And and that's that's kind of that the balance that... We'd need to try and strike, especially when we're trying to engage parents, because they are the gatekeepers ultimately to all of this new tech, aren't they? Yeah, and I, I don't, I, I, I don't know the right way to bring you advice on that because I, I live my life immersed in the new tech and trying to understand how it's useful. Um, my kids seem to have emerged unscathed through my parenting, but I, I would definitely not think I'm a particularly great role model for for a parent. I I probably encourage them to run with scissors way too early in their, in their <laughs> lives and the bigger scheme of things. But they um, they seem to have emerged remarkably remarkably kind of intact and self confident young people. Um, so I, I was I was reflecting on on the role of parents and uh, around sort of confidence and the learning and. You were, you were asking about my own parents. I I think I'm I don't think I was particularly self-confident growing up, but I certainly am now, and it's part of my work persona. I'm quite often asked to speak in public places. We met we met as I was doing a, a talk on AI at BET. Mm -hmm. Um and um I think one of the things that helped me build that confidence was weirdly, my parents and probably my mother in particular are just determined that I'm amazing and even when I'm really not amazing she's just always amazed by whatever I do or whatever I say oh that's so interesting ah. and I um and I I think there's there's something that you just get this adoring bask of bask of adoration from right. from parents su sustained over a long period of time and I think it's a it, it is an amazing kind of it slowly builds up the thin layers of foundation and foundation and foundation and foundation but over time it really it really does strengthen you um there's a uh you a, have a, a great... sense of autonomy 
you did have a sense of autonomy as well though she let you she gave you the space to discover yourself she wasn't saying right Jeff well you're going to play this now right Jeff you're going to play that now you know she was mm -hmm. a, a lot she was seeing you she was giving you making making you feel noticed and seen wasn't she and accepted you were accepted whether you were just about starting out in in something or becoming a specialist in something maybe yeah, that, I, I think so. I think so. Um, there's a, a, a lovely, um, a lovely thing called the granny net. I don't know if you've heard if you've heard of granny net before. Um, it's a um, suddenly blanked out his name. There's a, um, a fantastic professor in Wolverhampton somewhere. He's got Indian origin, and he he set up some early sort of learning technology experiments where he put it was called the hole in the wall project, where he went into very rural, uh, sort of slum-ish areas of India, and put a computer sort of literally like a bank machine into, into the into mounted in the wall and just left it there with no instructions and the local kids were kind of coming and playing and poking and it, initially it was just in English and they weren't even English first language speakers and they were kind of poking and navigating it and trying to find how to do things and it had sort of remarkable success of, of actually people learning to do things and figuring it out without clear instruction and he, he had a sort of a expanded out on that on sort of different learning theories and ways of reaching students who you can't otherwise reach because because you've got these sort of interventions and one of the thing he one thing he set up was I call, I'm pretty sure it was called the granny net and the idea was that um your, your granny a, a notional granny actually can help you feel better about your studies by doing what my mom did, just sort of looking over your shoulder and going, oh, that's very clever. Oh, how does that work? And not really knowing how the thing works that you're explaining, but you're explaining, oh, I'm doing this electronics project or, oh, it's a maths formula, I did this. And she goes, oh, explain how that goes. And you tell your granny and she goes, oh, that's very interesting. So, so he had this idea that maybe you could do that virtually online. So he sort of put out an ads for literally grannies, people who had retired and wanted to do good to say, hey, will you talk to people who are just students doing their homework? And he connected a whole bunch of grannies to a whole bunch of students doing homework. And they did that. Grannies were saying, oh, that's very cool. Oh, how does that work? And the student would just talk about what's going on in their lives. And it, it was it actually was remarkably effective. This was some time ago, but it, it follows a little bit that the, the benefit of just being appreciative and giving people time. I love that. It really does build connection, doesn't it? Just yeah. people feeling noticed and attended to, which harks back to the early years and everything else. And uh, I mean, my tutor, I actually used my tutor with one of my children. It's an amazing, amazing um, company helping thousands and thousands and thousands of children who are feeling anxious about their learning or feel like they've got gaps or helps parents to feel slightly less guilty that they can't help their children with homework, AKA my daughter with her A-level biology. I haven't got a clue. You know, I, I had to go at one of her papers. I just read it through. I was like, I literally can't do any of these questions. I did university maths. I did university oh. maths and I was trying to help my son with his GCSE maths a few years ago and I couldn't do it. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what, what happened? So yeah. I know so exactly. yeah. I mean, like, no, thank you for thank you for mentioning my tutor. I mean, it's it's actually very sweet because we we it does virtual tutoring exactly what you've described. You've got a student struggling with GCSE or A levels or struggling even on like softer softer approaches, exam techniques, and we find university students, so not older tutors, but the university students, somebody who's quite close to them in age, and we try and match them sort of personality wise to be a, a sort of virtual mentor, coach, tutor, and we do. Um, what we and it works really well, and, and I, I think it partly works well because you, it's somebody who knows the subject. But I think it partly works well because there's a bit of chemistry. I mean, you 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 will know from your child, but there's a bit of chemistry, and it's somebody who cares and takes the time. And we 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 we, we try to understand what actually happens in these sessions, what what's taught, and it's really a mix. Sometimes it's study that they're stressed about their exams and the, and the tutor talks to them about how to plan for their exams. And sometimes, sometimes it's about the confidence to stand up and speak in the class rather than actually the ability. And so they, they work on that. So it, it, it's quite, it's quite lovely because it, it's not just focus on the subject that could be where it starts, but quite often the thing that the student needs is, is softer around the edge. And our, our, our uni, uni students are, are very, very good at that. Some Thank do you, literally yeah. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of tutoring. They they get something out of it as well. So it's a kind of mutually beneficial thing. It's a beautiful ecosystem of learning that's kind of 
fuels itself. It's brilliant. Yes, I think Simon Sinek, I think this there's a theme coming through here about mentoring and and coming alongside and championing and holding space for people. And I really believe that that play holds this potential to make the world a better place. And it's all about connection, people feeling connected with one another. Because I think the problem comes when we're disconnected. Simon Sinek talks about, you know, you just need one person championing you and it makes all the difference. And I really hope that, you know, as we progress with our ideas and we we, we flow forward, that we can... Um, just prompt people to pause and think, okay, where are the areas of disconnect here? How can I build more connection? When's the last time I played? When's the last time I thought I problem solved? When's the last time I paused and thought, I'm just going to journal what I'm feeling right now, or I'm just going to play a computer game and just, just find my flow in that way. And yeah, I wonder... Does pause, play, connect resonate with you? And if 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 I gave you this model and say, here we go, you know, you've done, you've worked with lots of researchers, and uh, sorry, I'm going to have a little squirrel moment. The word research does not spark me at all. Like I hate the word research. It sounds so dry. When I was when I was when I was growing up, I thought researcher. That's just yeah. And over the last few years, I've met the most incredible researchers because I was like, when I did my education, I was like, right, I'm not studying anymore. That's it. And then at 37, I then do a postgrad. And and uh, now I'm thinking, pause, play, connect, be a whole PhD. I could do a whole massive, you know, research uh massive load of research on proving the model in certain situations because we've, we've worked with displaced families from war we've worked you know worked with mm -hmm. stressed out ceo families yeah anyway so going back to that that's that's just sometimes words you don't realize i needed some experiences in life and i needed to meet certain people to just break that kind of um preconceived notion i, I, uh, I think i think um one of the I'll come back to your original question in a moment, but one of the lessons I've learned repeatedly my whole life, and I, I keep learning it, and I really appreciate learning it, is that you you have a preconceived idea about a person, a type of person, a nationality, a place, <laughs> and then you go there and you spend some time and you realize your idea is probably entirely wrong or 90% wrong and so wrong that you really shouldn't have that. And you sort of, that, that preconception breaks. And then you have a different experience with a different preconceived idea about that type of person, or that, and that breaks. always learning. <laughs> and uh, yeah, t t totally. And it just, it just, I kind of, I feel like I'm peeling layers, of, layers of an onion back, and uh, to try and find the my, the real me underneath all of those, because most of the preconceptions I had actually were proven wrong. Um, in fact, that's something I really like about living in um, living in the UK is that there's a lot of other nationalities that all live here together, and you kind of bump into people, and you and you've got friends from all all sorts of places that you've never visited before, and it's just I, I just I love that because it's continually just reminding you that you know you, you've got a fairly small worldview, and their worldview mm -hmm. is different, it's mm -hmm. different, and just recalibrate. Or, or you create something that you think's this big, like like this model, and then we took it abroad, and they're like. I was talking to someone in Albania and I was saying, do you think this model will, will help you with your family? She said, yeah, everyone's got a mobile phone. They know what pause means. And the symbols that I had used for the logo were actually universal symbols. And I hadn't even like planned it like that. But then we found, oh my goodness, we've just, and then Canva suddenly has translate um, and I can just get all my designs, just press a button and it's now in, uh, I can just, it's, it's now in Polish. And it's incredible, isn't it? How um, yeah, sometimes yeah. you come up with a tiny little thing, and and I know it's tiny, but people can apply it, and they they take it for themselves, and they think, yeah. So that's that was just a question. I mean, um, so you yeah, you asked what, me at the beginning about, about the pause, pause play, play, and play, reflect, connect, um, connect and yeah, I, and yeah. I, and I, 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 because we, we've only just met, and I hadn't yeah. given it too much too much thought. So I've quite enjoyed hearing you explain explain it and reflect reflect on it. I guess. Um, What's what's widely what's widely established is a good thing for those busy professionals with manically stressed out lives that you were describing. 
is to find a way of partitioning your day up or having a time where you sort of reflect and plan on what's coming. It, it's really bad practice to just rush into the next day and rush into the next day. It's, it's really important to stop and pause and reflect a little bit, um, which is your pause, right? Um, and lots of people I know who kind of succeed at senior levels of, of uh, in the sort of workplace, meditate and have other practices breath holding practice or quite into yoga or things which are not quite play but it's a sort of a a moment where you disassociate from the worky things you need to do and you do something which is about inner calm and and i guess i guess in a way that's not too far off the play yeah it's um, playing when i think about myself breath. like like creative yeah, writing it, it, is playing with words exactly you know, I, with sound, I, I don't production. think yeah Exactly. I, I don't think I play enough. I think I think the, the takeaway I'm having is I should be making more active time to be more playful in my day to day. But but I guess even my work persona is a bit playful. I'm sort of, you know, it's quite common that we arrange hack days and we we do sort of moments of create weird moments of creativity or try and change the change the pace or the mood in a meeting by getting everybody standing up and doing something different. And so there's a little level of sort of goofiness as well as the stress and the get stuff done. So I, I try and kind of mix it, mix it into the day just to make it feel more, more human. Mm -hmm. I do think that some successful business people um, are very good communicators and also just good at f someone feeling heard. They're good listeners and they can build that connection and that rapport very quickly. And you have to, and you're going into different business meetings and, and things like that. And that openness and stance and confidence, that self-esteem that all the research, we don't need any more research saying that play is good for us and that it builds self-confidence and self-esteem and stuff. It, it's there. Now I'm just passionate about getting the message there out in a simple way. Um, but coming down to land, um, there was, I, I would like to just mention your book that you've written, Engines of Engagement. Is that right? Yes. yes. I yes. just started reading it and oh, wow. Thank got you. my hands on a copy. And I was really impressed at the opening. And in the second kind of page, they were talking about, they were just asking loads of questions saying that AI is here, it's here to stay, it's great. It, yes, it can be dangerous. But they were quest questioning things like, you know, where should we be looking and listening? What should we be doing right now to shift our mindsets into this new reality? So you're challenging educators especially. What should we fight? What should we receive as a gift? And what do we stand to lose? All these questions, I was like, wow, like... <laughs> That can that could take up a whole podcast in itself. And I know you love, and I, I just, I'd encourage people to follow your work. And if you want to give me some links that I can put in that will sort of put you to some, towards blogs or some of your thoughts, thought leadership on this um, and, and the book. Yeah, I'd be happy to, exciting, I'd be happy to share yeah? that. I'd be happy to share that. I mean, <laughs> if you, if you, um, we're available in most bookshops or Amazon or anywhere else. If you just search engines of engagement um, with my name, I've written it with, together with two co-authors. So the the process of writing was was an aspect was it was a play because we had to try and find a shared language between us, and we even built the graphics between the three of us, um, and wow. sort of took turns to add different layers on top. So so that work in itself was a bit of an experiment to see if we could do that. Um, but we were we all come from slightly different disciplines, but we're quite united in an, an enthusiastic interest about what's coming on with AI and what's possible, but but also a sort of reflection on what that's going to mean for society, for workplaces, for families, for education. Um, and so we, we tried to write it as sort of teasing out some of those questions, because I think I think it's easy to see things very, in a very binary way. It's good, mm. it's bad, mm. that one's good, that one's bad. And actually, it's moving so fast that whatever opinion you have today is probably going to be out of date in two weeks' time. And so we, we were trying to find a way of, of of framing it so people could read through that and then have some frame of reference when they when they're having a conversation about will will computers take over? Is that general AI? You know, are we going to be taken over by robots? And so we just wanted to give a sort of a bit of a, a framing. Um, it's available, it is available to buy. Um, it's also available for free as a digital download. So if you've got people who, who can't afford to buy it um, and are happy to read it as a PDF, 
again, if you just search for the name, you'll see it on our on our publisher's website, and you can put your email address in, yeah. and we'll we'll send you we'll send you a free version. Um, but yeah, I, I, AI is exactly the kind of thing that we should be encouraging people to play with right now and to yeah. just try to understand yeah. because it's it's a weird thing and there's some fun bits and there's some weird bits and there's some scenarios where it can be really abused and there's moments of beautiful serendipitous creativity that can come out of it and it's the kind of thing that you need to spend an hour or two just trying don't just go in once once yeah. you'll make one picture or you'll make one poem and you'll go ah, that's impressive and you'll move on but <laughs> do do a bunch of things i have um that's spend a bit of that. time spend a couple of hours kind of keep going till you till you till you can create something yeah. I, I like um, one one great one thing I'm really enjoying at the moment. There's a um, something called Text FX, which right. is a, a Google experiment where they got some of their AI, their, their previous AI generating thing, and they partnered with some musicians and a rapper. And um, oh yeah, they, they they they've they've created this tool that helps you do playful things with words around building a rap or a song or finding I words. I did that, it, that, actually. You, yeah, have you, you done write, that? You can write, you can type in words and then it just makes it into a song and then you can change the genre of the song because it could be like country, you, and it could be hip-hop. You, you can, you can do that. that. You can do that, although this is actually even more clever than that because what you've described there, quite a lot of AI can do that. Uh, you can yeah. might write, write a song really well. You can you can create lyrics. This is more on a more fine-grained level of playing with the, the prosody of words. It's a sort of, it's it's a tool for for rappers who are building new new lyrical flows so wow. it's quite specific oh wow it's actually the flow because when I was doing songwriting at the end of last year with my year eights or nines or whatever I would find that the pupils kept getting stuck when I told them to write some lyrics and they just kept just hitting a wall hitting a wall and then they didn't get on to actually doing the music bit so I was like right write a lyrics but if you can't I just went on chat GPT and I say write me a song about forgetting your shoes at school and having to wear daps and having to go to the the, you know, the, the school office and it wrote me like loads of verse in the chorus and then I like wrapped it really badly to the class to like just completely destroy it and then they would they were very e found very easy to like think well I can do better than that and then they would have a go so nice. um you know I think it's very been nice. so helpful for me me I mean I've tried to do things like create a level music resources with chat GPT and, it, and it, it's it's not got accurate information in there yet but it can just help the creative process and just help people to go go a bit further a little bit faster and actually start to enjoy it so yeah I mean I could talk about that for hours but um if if you could just just you know jump on your soapbox for the last few minutes and just say what you'd love to change about where education's going in the UK, maybe globally at the moment, would there be one kind of strong, resounding message that you'd want to 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 share? Nice. Um I don't get in the UK why there's such inequality in different schools and in different regions. I, I just Genuinely don't get that. And I know it's part of a UK culture thing and you've got the sort of private and state schools and you've got all these different separate ways of doing things. And you, but, but I, I just genuinely don't get that. I think, I think education is the most critical, important thing we can be doing. I think you should be throwing twice as much money into the poorer areas to try and help give the kids who are coming through those areas a better chance. I think you should be giving them free breakfast and free lunches to try and help kind of build stronger, stronger citizens of the future. Um, I, I, I think a lot of our efforts to centrally worry about progress at schools and the inspections and the, the sort of te testing oh. actually is taking some, sucking some of the, the love and the joy out. And so it probably started with a really good intention, but it's having all these unintended consequences of actually making it harder to, to help those kids succeed and get to the end of school and feel like empowered citizens. Instead, school is just feeling like a chore and something you want to get away from as soon as possible. And I, th I think it's a real sad missed opportunity um, because it, it's, a, it's an amazing moment of young people's lives that they're learning and growing. And you have to narrow down to three subjects in A-level. I mean, I, who knows what they want to do at A-level, right? So I, I think we've got a bunch of, I, I would 
so I haven't given you one thing. I've given you a bunch of things. Keep going. You're absolutely, I'm I'm loving this. Yeah. But I'm not an expert of school. So I'm, I'm I'm an expert. I'm an enthusiast for helping people embrace the world and learn about each other. So I would, I would be encouraging other languages because I think we live on one island, but there's all these other people all around us and, Actually, most of them we can't talk to. So, so, so learn some other languages. Um, learning another language is like learning music. It helps. It actually broadens your your intellectual curiosity and your ability to succeed in all sorts of other things. Um, yeah, so I, I would be I would be enthusiastically trying to make a, education a, a a less stressed, less sort of target driven, slightly more open, playful experience, um, and really celebrating people finding themselves in it and not people sort of mastering one of three subjects. Um, yeah, that would be my, that'd be my, <laughs> my wish. That is really beautiful. I think that's absolutely, it resonates as someone who's been in the education system for over 20 years. Um, and I totally, totally agree. And it's pretty heartbreaking what's going on in some areas. So yeah, mm-hmm. thanks for, for shouting about that. Um, final thoughts, really. I've just really enjoyed talking with you. And I think our listeners will be really interested and, and feel really engaged. Um, is there anything you want to leave listeners when it comes to pausing, playing, education, building connection, just living our best lives? I think really as an adult, you know, you're a busy businessman who has got a lot of responsibility, you know, and you're trying to find balance. I'd love to hear, you know, what you think are a kind of top tip or a way of you know living or your philosophy your own philosophy is i think i think the people around you are really important and i think that in a work context i think it's worth investing the time to help the people around you feel valued and to kind of lift them up a bit because you get lifted up by them being lifted up i think it's it's worth taking the time to mentor somebody junior in the organization who's struggling it's worth taking the time to to meet some of the other people in your street so that your street feels like a bit more of a community instead of just a street um you know it's it's worth spending the time my wife and i both work too much and if we're not careful we're both sitting at desks in different bits of the house and we don't talk to each other all day it's worth taking the time to just sit outside and have a cup of tea and kind of look, look at what? the i don't know birds in the garden or something i, I, I think this maybe is a getting older thing but uh I think building the people around building the people around you up and investing time in them is like the gift that just continues to keep giving. I guess that's probably my my piece of advice. And so I use that, I apply that at work, I apply it to team dynamics and how I build teams. I to apply it to my friends and family. You probably all think I work too hard and don't spend enough time with them. But um yeah, that's that'd probably be that. That is fantastic. What a lovely way to end. <laughs>